And let me start by saying this is a, a first for Ventilation Matters to have uh, two of the members actually sitting in the same location. And we're really yeah. lucky to be sitting in the home of the Society of Mechanical Ventilation. So uh, thank you very much, Ahab, for inviting us. And uh, we have a very exciting presentation. Uh, that presentation will uh, be Ahab's uh, discussion of mechanical power during course mechanical ventilation. So uh, here we go. And let me, uh, let me take the screen and... Okay, you should see yep. a mechanical power presentation. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And uh, really happy to see Steve here for the for the first time face to face. It's really great. And hopefully, see all all of you guys one one day soon. Um, I'm gonna jump into this uh, presentation. It's just basically some work we did about mechanical power. Um, and the reason is I still think mechanical power is new, uh, still misunderstood. And um, I'm going to go into an introduction of a couple of studies that we did, and then we can have some discussion. And I have something new. Uh, it's not published yet. Uh, so I would caution you that like it's, uh, it's peer reviewed already, but it's not published. So we'll talk about a couple of studies we did. They're all bench studies uh, comparing uh, mechanical power in AVM2, Adaptive Ventilator Mode 2, with the conventional modes, volume control, and PRVC in a normal lung uh, simulator. Then the same study we repeated again in an ARDS model uh, with three severities. Uh, we'll talk about it. And another one which I thought was pretty cool is like comparing mechanical power in independent lung ventilation. And we coined actually the term power compliance index because uh, we'll talk about it a little bit because I think it's really important um, to index like the power to, to some many. And the last one that's the one I was talking about, uh, alveolar mechanics and alveolar mechanical power. This is a new concept. And again, you might be aware of it in the group, but it's still not published yet. And please feel free to stop me like whenever you. Okay, so quick, quick introduction about uh, mechanical power. Of course, it's based on the equation of motion which is the ventilator pressure equal basically elastic pressure, resistive pressure, and P pressure. So when you divide them, so P mass plus P vent, that's the whole total pressure to overcome the elastic uh, pressure, the resistive pressure, and the P pressure. So the formula becomes like P mass P vent equal uh, elastance times volume, resistance times flow, uh, plus P. So mechanical power depicts the energy transferred to the respiratory system during certain period of time. And it's uh, measured as uh, joules per minute. Just little physics uh, work, which is uh, in joules equal force, which is the pressure, displace, uh, times dis displacement, which is volume. So to come at the end of it, what is mechanical power is basically volume times pressure. Um, you have to, to get the joules per minute, you have to do correction factor 0 0.098, multiplied by the respiratory rates, mm -hmm. again, multiply pressure times type of volume. Mm -hmm. um, again, quickly, to make things more complicated, uh, Gattinoni talked about this back in 2016, I think, or 18. Um, and it, the mechanical power basically includes all... Um, the factors that we set on the ventilator and the patient does. Instead of focusing only on tidal volume or driving pressure alone, now we're talking that pressure can hurt the lung, volume can hurt the lung, flow can hurt the lung, respiratory rate can hurt the lung. Uh, and of course, contribute to all the barotrauma, volutrauma, biotrauma. So those small uh, paragraphs here in the bottom left, it's basically mechanical power calculation. And the left here is in volume controlled mode and on the right side on pressure controlled mode. So you can divide the mechanical, uh, again, this is the pressure versus volume. So you can divide it into resistive part, which is this small part here, and elastic part. And to make things more complicated, the elastic can make it static, which is peep work, and dynamic, which is the tidal work. And again, you can see here the difference between pressure control and volume control. 
pressure control gives higher uh, mechanical power just based on the shape of the curve. So it wasn't uh, complicated enough. So some people decided, okay, um, let's complicate it a little bit more. Uh, we'll, we'll do um, the concept of inspiratory work. Um, can I? Yeah. This? Okay. Um, so the resistive work, of course, is the heat generating sort of the airway resistance. <clears throat> We were not going to see them if somebody is like sticking their tongue in. Uh, elastic work is the work need to expand both the lung and the chest wall. So it's that area under the blue curve here. That's the elastic work. And peep work again, which is the static. Uh, the work against the peep. Uh, the peep is totally war is energy gen uh, stored there. And then inspiratory work is the sum of the tidal work and the resistive work. So now let's take the tidal work of the elastic part and the resistive part. And this will come important when we talk about AVM. Tidal work alone is again, the, the elastic dynamic part of the curve and the total work, of course, the area under the whole curve. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, those again, there is multiple uh, multiple calculations. Um, the the best way, the gold standard to measure the mechanical power or the work is basically to measure the area under the curve here of the volume pressure curve, <coughs> and it's basically again the integral of the volume versus the pressure. So I'm not a mathematician or an engineer, so um, some people smarter, much smarter than me, like Gattinoni and Bescher made uh, uh, calculations or equations to calculate it. Each has its own problems and there's a lot of, you know, uh, um, modifications of those uh, calculations. Basically, as simple as we said, it's the volume multiply the pressure and those are the component of the pressure, the elastic static, which is the tidal, the, uh, sorry, the peep pressure, the elastic dynamic, and the resistive. So volume times pressure times respiratory rate times the conversion factor. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, to be honest with you, if I even use the equations <coughs> to calculate the mechanical power, every time the patient's respiratory rate changes, of course, the number will change. Every time the patient starts working, the number will change. Uh, if you change the volume, the pressure. So it's practically impossible every time you change or do something to keep calculating the mechanical power. So finally, there is a software. This is the Bella Vista. And there is a software. Um, it's not uh, FDA approved in the US yet. Um, uh, thanks to Graham, he was able to, uh, to help me get this software. So we don't use it on patients, but on the simulator. And it basically calculates for you breath by breath. This is the uh, tidal power. There's inspiratory power and the total power. Otherwise, if I do study, like I cannot like just keep calculating. It will be very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool part about it. All right, so we'll jump into our first study. And I know there will be a lot of tables and figures, you know, I'm gonna cruise through them. Um, this is the first study that we did, comparison of mechanical power between AVM2 versus conventional modes, like volume control in a normal lung model. <clears throat> um, and basically what we found that mechanical power uh, in AVM2 was, uh, was less, even comparing the AVM2 to low tidal volume. So I'll, I'll show you how did we um, construct the study. Sorry, I'm done. So it's a bench study in a passive uh, single compartment um, uh, model. The compliance was set at 50 and resistance at 10. And that's kind of like little, maybe a little bit uh, in the lower normal range on the ventilator. And we picked three modes, the AVM2, pressure regulated volume control. So I can uh, control the tidal volume and the volume control mode. And what we did is we set both the PRVC and the volume control mode at the low tidal volume, six milliliter per kg. And uh, we set the respiratory rate to compare 
uh, to get basically to compare a uh, hundred percent uh, minute ventilation uh, on the AVM and 150 percent. So the model was at 70 kilogram person, so 100 percent minute ventilation would be seven liters, and like here, and um, 150 would be 10.5 liters per minute. Of course, we had to change the the rate and the, the respiratory rate and the PRVC and volume control to get the equivalent minute ventilation. We wanted to be like basically. Uh, fair for both for both modes. So we did the experiments again, as I said, one was seven liters, one was ten and a half liters, and with two different peak levels, one at five and one at ten. So we called them experiment A, B, and one A, B, and two. So we did basically four uh, experiments. Quickly, the results here, you can see it. A A A AVM2 is the blue one, uh, volume control is the orange, and PRVC is the green one. Um, so this is the one with uh, seven liters per minute. You could notice that the AVM supplies, uh, gives the low mechanical power. This is people five, people 10, uh, here with the 10.5 liters per minute. Same thing. Um, basically, AVM gave us the least mechanical power in both of them. Of course, we can argue that the, if you look in the next, sorry. Oh, so, yeah, just a, I don't know, switched after. <laughs> so those are the, are the results here. Like, um, quickly, this is the tidal volume um, in, in AVM with 100% for 6.4. Um, the driving pressure. If you notice here, basically, that the tidal volume was equivalent to the low tidal volume that we set on the volume control and pressure control, 6.1. The driving pressure was less than the volume, than the driving pressure in both volume control and pressure control, uh, PRVC. Um, then once we increased uh, the minute ventilation to 150, of course the tidal volume went up in the, um, in the AVM, um, but the respiratory rate was less than the conventional modes. So this is again quickly to see like the mechanical power, 8.76 versus 9.78, 10.82, and of course, the statistical values, the p-values were all super significant. And the reason behind that uh, is because it's simulators. So the standard deviation uh, between the breath and the pressure was very little. So any number will be um, uh, statistically significant. But of course, as the more that we increased the uh, minute ventilation, the difference became more obvious. You can see 14.76, 15.79, 18.29. So in conclusion, a normal long AVM had uh, less mechanical power. Oh. Aha. Um, I'm going to jump in into the second study, which we did a little bit more uh, elaborate. So we did, uh, we tested an ARDS long model, same kind of uh, criteria. But this time we went a little bit crazy because I said, oh, four experiments are little, so let's uh, uh, make it bigger a little bit. So what we did is... Um, we did three long models, ARDS models. One was a compliance of 40, we called it mild. One compliance of 30, we called it moderate. One compliance of 20, and we called it severe. The resistance is the same and assumed that the ideal body weight 70 kilograms. Now we compared the same three uh, ventilator modes, AVM, PRVC, and volume control. And then we did six different scenarios. Basically, instead of two levels of minute ventilation, we did three levels. 100%, 150%, 200%. And we did three levels of PEEP, 10, 15, 20. So it ended up doing 81 experiments, which um, I think it was too much and kind of blew my face doing statistics. But um, again, if you can see here, these are the, the graphs, the results. Um, this is in 100%, uh, uh, this top row is in 100% minute ventilation, PEEP 10, PEEP 15, PEEP 20. And of all of them, uh, AVM was less, followed by uh, PRVC, followed by, uh, sorry, followed by volume control in orange, followed by PRVC in all the models. Again, same, same results uh, here, but what we did different, um, so again, this is a mild ARDS, compliance 40, PIP 10, PIP 15, PIP 20, and so forth. Uh, these are the numbers for the mechanical power, but what we decided is like, um, we want to index that mechanical power to the severity of the lung. 
um, because we can be all like five or six of us here having the same mechanical power exactly. But if I'm my compliance is worse, uh, which one would be basically more injurious? Is the lung is the healthy lung more prone to injury, or the diseased lung is more prone to injury? And I tried to um, search that topic. Um, I, I I didn't find any good. Um, um, I actually find very contradictory, uh, basically arguments or uh, thoughts not based on studies. Some people say that the, the healthy lung is more prone to lung injury. Some say, no, the injured lung is already more prone to lung injury. So the reason of indexing this mechanical power to the compliance is just to be able to compare better, more, um, you know, between the same mechanical power. So again, of course, as you can see, since the mechanical power is less in all the AVM, so the mechanical power to the compliance index is always less in, um, in AVM2. Same thing here. This is now the 150%, so I'm not going to bug you. Again, same results. AVM was less, followed by volume control and pressure control, and they were all very statistically significant. Oops. Okay. Um, do you need uh, any breaks or anything or any? No. Okay. I'll hmm. keep going unless you guys feel again. Feel free to interrupt me. Now I'm going to jump into um, a third uh, search, kind of similar, but um, my always my thought is I did uh, independent lung ventilation a couple of times in my life, and I thought it makes much more sense. Again, we know that our lung is super heterogeneous. Uh, even in ARDS and every, even normal lung is heterogeneous, but especially in unilateral lung disease, like especially when we have pneumonia here, are we injuring which lung, the healthy lung or the bad lung? So we decided to do uh, this, um, calculate the mechanical power and power compliance index in the independent lung ventilation. And it was very, very interesting, actually. Um, I'm just going to jump into the picture here. So this is, was our model here. Um, one bad lung was a compliance of 10, and one better lung was a compliance of 30. Uh, so the, the total compliance was 40, and we, we uh, ventilated them with one ventilator, and we calculated the mechanical power. Then we put, as if we put uh, uh, dual lung uh, ventilation, which basically we used the two ventilators and uh, uh, two simulators each side. So this lung on the left side, we made it a compliance of 10, and this one is compliance of 30. And we calculated the mechanical power in each one of them. We did it in two ways. First, like here, uh, we put the patient on uh, tidal volume 400, PEEP of seven, and we did it with volume control and pressure control. Then we repeated the same studies, like almost getting total tidal volume 400, but giving the, the bed long of compliance of 10, 100 tidal volume, and the compliance of 30, you give it 300 tidal volume. And we measured them with the same PEEP, so PEEP of seven and PEEP of seven. So to compare it almost to the same as if we were rotating one lung, uh, two lungs. Then we repeat the same experiment again with one with the bad compliance with PEEP of 10 and the better compliance with PEEP of eight. And I tried to get an inflection point basically to try to see how much PEEP should I do it. So this is like, you know, instead of like reading all of these things. The, the results was very, very interesting. So this is a single lung ventilation. On volume control, uh, we got pre, uh, mechanical power level 12.61. As expected, pressure control was higher, 14.25. Then when we repeated uh, with both lungs, the same tidal volume, in the independent lung ventilation with the same PEEP of seven, it, the mechanical power in both lungs were, was less than ventilating both lungs at the, with one ventilator. And this was like actually uh, unexpected for me because I thought somehow they were going to be at least equal, but they, it, was, it was less. Same with pressure control when we did the independent lung ventilation with the same PEEP, that mechanical power was less than ventilating uh, both lungs together. Now, when we did with different PEEP, the bad lung was 10 PEEP and the better lung was 8 PEEP, you can see in volume control, it was slightly less. So even here, people of eight and people of 10, the mechanical power was a little bit less than uh, ventilating uh, both of them with the same peak. In pressure control, it was a little bit higher, 14.52 uh, versus 14.25. And again, this is the same, uh, same 
table again. So single long was 12.61. The independent long totaled 11.39. So the, the compliance of search was 8.24. The compliance of 10 was 2.55. Uh, different PEEP, 12.61. Um, the compliance of search was 9.43, 3.01. Same with pressure control. So I thought this was like just really interesting, unexpected, which tells me that independent lung ventilation is actually might be a little bit safer, especially in unilateral lung disease. Uh, I'm not going to bore you again. This is, uh, I did this, uh, the indexing again, mechanical power. Uh, versus the compliance index, and again they were uh, they were less in the independent lung ventilation. Um, same here. This was the other one was in volume control. This was in pressure control. So again, uh, we're comparing them against each other, um, and again they were significantly different in the independent lung ventilation. Okay, now uh, this is like, I, I feel, at least to me, this is the coolest part. Um, I will need the, all your input in this one. I know we discussed it a little bit. Uh, but basically the idea of, we always measure uh, respiratory mechanics as uh, um, compliance, resistance, auto peep, uh, all within the respiratory system uh, with the peak and plateau pressure and all the stuff, all the volume pressure curve. Um, but always becomes the part is like, okay, like, you know, uh, the compliance is of the old respiratory system. We know that the chest wall compliance adds to the problem. You know, now is the resistance really important uh, in injury of the lung? A lot of unanswered questions again, you know. Um, so some people talk about transpulmonary um, mechanics or transpulmonary the, with an esophageal balloon. Here's the esophageal pressure, and this is a transpulmonary pressure. Now you can divide the respiratory mechanics into lung uh, mechanics and chest wall mechanics. And most of the time, we don't really worry about the chest wall mechanics. We assume it uh, doesn't change, you know, but of course in obesity or um, stiff wall or whatever. Um, the other problem is also like, can we hurt the chest walls? And in my head, my brain, I don't think we can hurt cause injury to the chest wall, uh, to the ribs, and like maybe to, to the diaphragm somehow. Um, but anyway, so those are just like the equations that we measure um, the total respiratory mechanics. And of course, it will be volume over pressure, airway pressure minus uh, PEEP. The resistance, of course, PEAK minus plateau overflow. Now the chest wall compliance will be tidal volume over the end inspiratory esophageal pressure minus end expiratory esophageal pressure. Uh, and it's usually like very linear. The chest wall resistance is very, very minimal and it's almost non-existent. So I, we always ignore it. Then what really, what I think we're more interested in is the lung compliance because the lung is the, usually the one that we injure. So the transpulmonary uh, pressure we, the, to measure the lung compliance, it will be uh, tidal volume. Uh, expiratory tidal volume over end inspiratory uh, transpulmonary pressure. Here, sorry, end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure uh, minus the end expiratory pleural pressure. So uh, here, so basically, we're talking about the transpulmonary driving pressure. Um, and the long resistance, of course, will be. Sorry. Um, the peak um, uh, transpulmonary pressure minus the end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure over the flow. So we, we all know this, those are all documented and known, but came to also what bothers me is we know that the dead space is significant in even a normal lung. We assume it's like, you know, what, one third take a give of, the, uh, of the tidal volume. So why are we worried about, why are we measuring the whole tidal volume? Because this dead space um, volume is basically just sitting in our conducting airway, this, uh, you know, stuff. So it doesn't really distend the functional lung units, which is the alveoli. So the thought was, why don't we just measure the alveolar tidal volume and uh, over, uh, over the transalveolar pressure, and that will give us the alveolar compliance. It sounded simple to me, but and I just really not sure. And again, I would like to hear your feedback. 
why was it never ever mentioned in the literature? And I tried to do some search. Nobody talks about alveolar compliance. Everybody talks about alveolar tidal volume and the dead space, uh, but there is no mention about alveolar mechanics per se. So what we did is, um, of course, you all know this. This is the volumetric capnometry and the three phases, one, two, and three. Um, this is the CO2 versus, sorry, this is the CO2 versus the volume. So according to the curve here, um, this is the, the anatomical dead space, and this is the whole alveolar tidal volume. If you plot in phase two, this uh, line between uh, called AB, A and B, and a line between C and D that divides this area into Q and P. Um, anyway, not to make it like too much uh, complicated, but basically you can divide again, uh, anatomical dead space and tidal volume dead space. And I wanted to make sure that we're including the, the volume that is in the alveoli, but it's considered alveolar dead space because we know that uh, there is a volume in the alveoli that might not be uh, perfused, so there's a VQ mismatch is very big, um, but again, it's volume that is tending the alveoli, so we wanted to include it. So basically, we're taking this whole tidal volume here, and that will be our alveolar uh, tidal volume. And of course, again, you all know that um, there's so many mentions and different descriptions of uh, dead space. Um, so people again will uh, divide it into the physiologic dead space, which will be the anatomical plus the alveolar. And of course the total tidal volume is the anatomical plus the alveolar. And the alveolar again, you can divide it into this VE. Uh, so basically effective alveolar tidal volume, which is uh, basically perfused and uh, participates in this um, uh, ventilation and the dead space in the, of the alveolar tidal volume. Oops. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting used to it. So basically, this before we jump into this, because I made this, um, we also wanted, okay, we were able to we'll talk about how we're going to get the compliance, the alveolar compliance, but then how are we going to get the alveolar resistance? And again, it's never mentioned, Never nobody talks about alveolar resistance, assuming that alveolar resistance is also very minimal, and most of the resistance happens in the, our uh, large airways. Um, maybe the part that goes into the alveoli is resistance from the viscoelastic flow mm -hmm. and uh, turbulent flow. Um, but I'm assuming it still has resistance because there is flow. So what we did to calculate the resistance, um, first we wanted to know what's the flow in the alveoli. So the flow in the alveolar flow will be the alveolar tidal volume over the total inspiratory time. And uh, my friend, the Brazilian guy, uh, Dr. Claudio Frank, I invited him, but I think it was too late. He came up with this, which was very brilliant. Um, so basically, if we divide the flow over time, that's volume, I'm sorry, equal, um, um, oh my God, flow equal tidal volume over time. Um, so basically, it became that the resistance of the, uh, in the alveoli is the transpulmonary pressure um, minus the transalveolar pressure over the flow. And in the next slide, I will show you how did we get this. And sometimes there is a big confusion about what's the difference between transpulmonary pressure and transalveolar pressure. Uh, and I get, I always call it transpulmonary pressure, um, but uh, Rob Shadburn is not here because he's very particular about this. And I wrote a chapter with him in Egan 10 years ago and we described the difference. But basically transpulmonary pressure is defined as the airway pressure minus the plural pressure. Versus transalveolar pressure, it's the alveolar pressure, which is like uh, the plateau pressure minus the plural pressure. Um, this here is like a regular uh, volume pressure curve of the lung itself, because we use the transpulmonary pressure versus the volume, which is the volume is in the black. But when I did, we removed the, uh, the dead space, the anatomical dead space from the uh, ray, uh, total tidal volume, we get the alveolar tidal volume. So basically the concept is because since we're using the same transpulmonary pressure, but we're using different tidal volume, we can calculate the alveolar compliance according to a regular volume pressure curve. Um, 
Okay, this will maybe will make it a little bit easier. This is a graph I got. Volume control, square wave form, continuous flow, people 15, peak 28, plateau 25, uh, the flow is 20. This is also geal pressure. So during uh, the end exhalation is 14. Uh, during the peak pressure is, it's not much different, but 16. And during the plateau pressure is 14. So what we did, the alveolar compliance would be, sorry, and I put two, okay, good. And I put here, like, uh, this is a patient who was getting, I think, 300 tidal, 360 tidal volume. So this is the alveolar tidal volume, 214. And the dead space was uh, the rest, uh, which will be, uh, and I can't even see from, from the picture that I put. Uh, the, well, I think, I think that, well, it will be like 112, I think. So the total was 300, 360 minus 214. So the dead space was like about 140, which uh, comes to like dead space over total volume is 40%. So basically we took these numbers and the alveolar tidal volume, which is 215, and now we can calculate the compliance. So the compliance will be 214 over, um, over eight, which is basically uh, the, the delta, delta pressure. So uh, it comes to 26.7 pressure, uh, 26.75 milliliter centimeter water. Again, according to the last slide, we calculated the alveolar flow, which will be, now we have to make it in liters. So the 214 becomes 0 0.214, the inspiratory time 1.2. So the flow was 17, which is pretty close to the inspiratory flow, which was 20 here. According to this, we made the calculate the resistance. So it would be the 12 minus the 11, over the flow, so it comes as a resistance as 3.36. I think if you calculate the regular resistance from the peak minus plateau, it was like nine. Then we said, okay, let's take it a step further. Since now we know the compliance or the elastance of the alveoli, let's put them into the equation and calculate the alveolar uh, mechanical power. So we used Gattinoni's uh, formula. Um, basically, of course, uh, 0 0.098 times respiratory rate, Tidal volume times two, um, alve sorry, alveolar tidal volume times two plus half the elastance of the alveoli, which will be one over the 26, which comes to like 37, plus the alveolar tidal volume of P. So basically what we got here is that the total um, uh, alveolar mechanical power is 16.34. Um, and again, this is like the same equation here. When we calculate the mechanical power for the whole respiratory system, um, again, this is Gattinoni's equation. We use uh, the elastance of the whole respiratory system. If we want to calculate for the lung, the transpulmonary pressure, so we use the elastance of the lung. So now we call this alveolar or transalveolar mechanical power. We use the elastance of the, um, of the alveoli. So what are the implications for this? People might say, okay, you just like uh, some more equations and more I thought we we ought to like if we really believe in the concept of strain and stress and mechanical power, maybe we just need to get the, to the areas that most likely to be injured, which is which are the alveoli. So if you use this um, equations or deemed to be like really reasonable, correct, we can again calculate the alveolar mechanical power. We can cal calculate the alveolar stress, alveolar strain, and alveolar resistance. Again, understanding that our, still our lungs are um, not homogeneous. So of course, each part of the lung, or each alveoli has its own compliance and resistance and subject to a different stress and strain. Um, the problem with this uh, kind of our calculations um, is two things. First, we have to have an esophageal balloon to measure the transalveolar pressure. Um, uh, we know from studies that less than 1% uh, of clinicians use the, the, um, the osphageal balloon, which is unfortunately, I, I feel it's kind of shame. Um, and we have to have you use volumetric capnometry, uh, which is again, not used in every place. I think capnometry in general been standard of care, but people use just the time capnometry, like saying 34, 35. Mm -hmm. But we, I, I try to find what's <laughs> like, if there is, how many people use or the, use volumetric capnometry, but I couldn't find it. 
even in the less guidelines by the ARC saying, uh, suggest to use volumetric capnometry, which, I mean, the amount of information that we get from all this special balloon volumetric capnometry are great. So I try to use them both. Um, of course, a lot of respiratory therapists hate me for it <laughs> because it's too much work and we have to calibrate. And, um, but um, I guess that's it. And um, sorry if I took too much time. Not at all. Thank you. We have, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and then ask the group to make comments. Um, my, my initial thought on your early question about how come we don't have this is <clears throat> I think it's in the instrumentation, the, the lack of instrumentation available at the bedside. And of course, people are really busy at the bedside. So there's, as you just mentioned, a tendency not to to add more measurements unless it's profitable, unless it's clearly um, a guidance that people understand, it's complicated for them. So I think that's, uh, that's certainly one of the reasons. Uh, anyone else wanna make some comments? Patrick, you look like you wanna say something. Good comments only are allowed, so. Thanks, thanks very much. <laughs> That's very wonderful lecture. Enjoyed it very much. Thank um, you. I, I think your second study uh, with the benchmark one, uh, where you're comparing the uh, volume against uh, pressure regulated and uh, AVM2 is very nice. Um, there is an assumption, isn't there, that uh, the patients are fully mechanically ventilated and we haven't um, accounted for any uh, diaphragmatic work kind of thing. Yeah, okay, so I, I accept that. Um, I was uh, trying to figure out in my mind that conceptually, I would expect the mechanical power of um, volume control ventilation to be less, was it? Yeah, I, I would expect um, the volume control one to be gr greater than the PRVC rather than the other way around. I'm just trying, still trying to work that one out. Uh, so help me if you can on on that one, um, sure. and and of and uh, getting the uh, um, mechanical power on uh, the alveolar mechanical power is is uh, clearly where we need to have very good understanding and uh, and allowing for the fact that there is heterogeneity. Um, Maybe there could be a way in which we can do a, a mapping of, um, no, no, first of all, we, we look at uh, what is the range of the best and the worst um, alveolar mechanical compliance using this equation, uh, and then map it to the um, uh, alveolar heterogeneity as seen radio radiologically. Uh, so that we have an idea how many percentage of your lung is at the worst level of alveolar mechanical power and how many percentage of the lung radiographically is at the better level of alveolar mechanical power. Maybe that could be done in the future. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Um, you know, let's do the, the easy question, which is the, the mechanical power uh, between volume control and pressure control. Um, actually, I read one study before and they were talking, I can't remember the name of the, but they said that the, pre, uh, the mechanical power in pressure control will be less. And me as a lover of more like pressure control modes and not volume control modes, I was like, I believe that. But then if you look, um, um, I don't have the, the slides anymore. If you look at the, at the volume pressure curve that uh, I showed and um, if you look at the shape, again, as we said, it's uh, the mechanical power, basically volume times pressure. So this is in, uh, in a volume control with the constant flow. This is the airway pressure. So the shape of the, you know, of the volume pressure curve comes like this, um, smaller than the, the shape of pressure control. So if you look at the area of like the, even if you use the same uh, tidal volume, same uh, inspiratory time, same uh, pressure, um, just by the shape of the pressure control waveform, the resistive part is more uh, pronounced in the pressure control mode, even with the same resistance. 
And that's why I made some people look like, okay, maybe we should just remove the, the resistance from the equation totally because there's some arguments, especially with Marini saying is like, do we really care about the resistive power? Like, you know, this is just air uh, pressure work to, you know, just overcome the resistance, which makes sense to be honest with you. But uh, I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody knows the answer. Uh, but if you look at the tidal and the peak pressure, they're almost the same. Uh, matter of fact, in that study that we did, <clears throat> we calculated all, I mean, not we calculated, we got all the numbers from the tidal power, the inspiratory power uh, in, the, in the data. Uh, but I didn't do the analysis because it was already like 81 experiments. It was already so confusing. So maybe I'll add them in the next, uh, the next one. Uh, do, do a study, basically compare the which one, mostly what I'm interested in, honestly, is the tidal power. I think the peep is always the same. It's static, uh, although it can, of course, different peep power can make difference in lung injury. But I think it's the more the air going in and out that maybe uh, injures the lung. Again, I don't know the answer for this. Um, and the problem is also like really what I caution is, and I was trying to talk is like mechanical power still kind of new, despite being six, five, six years. We still don't know much about it, and I don't. I, I hope we don't get uh, led like what happened in the tidal volume, six liter per kg. So everybody now, like if we're targeting mechanical power below fifteen, we're good, you know, because uh, different it, the, the components have different weights to it, you know. So respiratory rate makes a big, big difference in mechanical power. Uh, so if you're in a rate of ten versus rate of twenty, whatever volume, you basically double the mechanical power. Um, the tidal volume and the driving pressure actually does not have the same weight as the respiratory rate. So that's why, again, I was trying to do the indexing. So, so we are not, again, into 6 milliliter driving pressure, but uh, uh, tidal volume, 15 of driving pressure, um, below 15 of mechanical power and stuff like that. The second part of your question, Patrick, of course, I don't know how to do this. Uh, you have a good idea about like the, um, the heterogeneity and which part are like so more collapsed and stuff like that. Uh, of course, we have actually, Steve, maybe you can uh, talk about this with your new device. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, that we have a ventilator that's applying a constant force, generally speaking, not talking about adaptive ventilation. And as the lung shrinks, <laughs> we have less area to work with and therefore, uh, knowing that gas is going to flow to the area of least resistance and more compliance, it only leaves that we're applying a greater amount of force, or as Crisoni says, in it, a greater intensity to healthy tissue as opposed to, to non-healthy tissue. But there's a lot of work uh, to be done. And Ross, you have your hand up? I don't know how to, how to manage that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I've, uh, it's very interesting. I, 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 the comment I want to make is I'm very pleased that someone's actually had a go at the resistant part of the, of the equation. It's, it's always worried me that resistance is not part of the power equation as far as the alveolar is concerned. Um, in fact, I'll go further. You, you, when you do your alveolar, calculations you were saying that there's some alveolar resistance my understanding is that beyond the alveolar sac the entrance of the alveolar sac there's minimal movement and it's by diffusion which carries no resistive property so there's no energy lost um and no energy therefore no energy transmitted um at the alveolar level so therefore i think you could virtually ignore the resistive component of it. um and your last comment about the uh, well, you said last comment about the resistance um, and increasing the rate. And there's a double whammy, of course, because as if you're looking at power and you increase the rate, you penalize, you penalize on power by the increased rate. As you said, you double the rate from 10 to 20, you will increase the, you double the power. But also, you will also increase the power if you're using the resistive force because the flows achieve the same tidal volume must be more. Um, the, the flows will be high, the pressures will be high. Therefore, you get double hit for increasing the rate. Um, so I don't think it's proportional. And you'll, 
it's the the uh, power seen at the Eola level is nothing to do with the rest of the forces. I think we need to somehow expand on that and continue to, to, to drive that. that. I think this has been a great, the emperor's new clothes, that, that in fact, total power has got nothing to do with power in the Albulus. If you're worried about how hard your ventilators have to work, that's true. But if you're worried about what's going on in the Albulus, they're different numbers entirely. Once they become the resistance in the UA, I've never seen a patient with ARDS of the trachea or the bodice. So, <laughs> Um, it was a fantastic presentation, but I, I would further remove any idea of alveolar uh, resistive component being part of it. Sir, sir, can you say that last part? Uh, I, I couldn't hear you. I, I, I'd remove, I'd remove any um, resistive component in the descri description of power in the alveolar. So I don't think that the resistance within the alveolar itself is an important component. Their flow is not turbulent because it's so so flow at all, and most of the movement is by diffusion, which has no resistant component. So um, I, I don't think there's any resistance and therefore any drop of resistive power um, in the alveolar sac itself. So. Almost an intra-alveolar resistance isn't, in a sense, existing because gas is occurring through right. diffusion at that yeah. point, but perhaps the measurement still exists because it's we don't have just a giant alveoli without yeah. conducting yeah. airways, yeah. as small as they may be, or connecting. Yeah, and, and, and again, that's why, like, my assumption was it's like, you know, it's just gas resistance, like, you know, uh, viscoelastic resistance more than there is <clears throat> more than the resistance that we Understand that, like air going in the tube in and out. Which yeah, is I true. agree. There may, there may be, there may be some, some some problems, but I don't I don't think it's, it's going to be less than you think. Less than you know, we calculate. So. <clears throat> so, I'm curious about uh, about AVM two. I I uh, have looked at AVM, and maybe. Uh, I think we have uh, a gram here. What are the the di what's the new elements of AVM two that potentially impact that uh, or make it different from traditional modes or even AVM one gram? Well, thanks, Steve. I was also I had another question, but now you've thrown it to me. But I'll I'll, ha I'll have a go at doing this. So. Um, with, you know, if you, th if you think about it, just go back a step, you've got PRVC, right, which is, um, or volume support. And so, in a way, what, what, what you have done with going from those more basic modes into you know, what we're doing with AVM is automating those into, like, in, you know, you're automating the adaptive component of those, the older, those type modes. So... Um, ASV was is the same as AVM, but they both use the Otis equation to um, minimal worker breathing to select an optimal breathing pattern. And um, you know, it's it's uh, pretty much tested on, on probably normal lungs and so on. It works quite well. It gives you know quite safe tidal volumes, um, safe rates, but also too, it's a, it's a negative feedback system, right? Um, so that means the ventilator is always trying to give a tidal volume the lowest possible pressure. That's the way it works. So it's, it's a negative feedback system. And the problem is, in, in some patients, of course, if you want six mils per kilogram as a number, it's probably the wrong mode for you because um, it, it, it's, it's not targeting a tidal volume, right? It's you, you can, Because you're the one setting a minute volume. You have set the minute volume and you let the ventilator try to determine tidal volume rate, I time is what it tries to do. And it's got lots of rules inside to do that. So it works pretty well. You can say 80 to 90% of all patients, it works very well. Um, the trouble is, though, in those low compliant lines, where if you want lower tidal volumes, maybe the tidal volumes are too high. So what happened was, um, I think in IMT, 
they developed uh, AVM2 using the um, mechanical power equation. And this was done uh, really with, with one of the engineers in, in um, IMT, a guy called Matthias van der Spey, who's a very smart guy who understands this, these equations very, very well. And he's picked up many faults in other algorithms, which I won't say who they are, what they are, but he's, he's picked them up very well. And so then I can remember one time we were, he and I went to see, and, um, went to see uh, Luciano Gattinoni and discussing with him about the mechanical power. And he picked up an error in what he thought Luciano was talking about. So... Um, Anyway, so that we what we've really done is we've autom we automated mechanical power into an adaptive ventilation concept, and so the idea is, you know, um, different uh, different breathing patterns and so on. Now, when, when we first developed it, if you're still there, Ross, and I can see you playing with your ear, but we you did some test cases of, in the early stage with AVM two to try and compare that in ARDS patients, and. The, the idea really was lower tidal volumes or less energy being applied to the lung at a higher rate because the problem with, for example, the um, AVM or ASV was the IE ratio. The, you couldn't get one-to-one -one IE ratio so much. You might get one-to-two one to IE ratio where normally clinically you want to increase the frequency in some patients and have maybe 18 breaths per minute, not 14 breaths per minute. And so AV, AVM2 actually covers that it goes down to like one-to-one -one IE ratio. So all these little, little things of um, optimizing the breath delivery is what AVM2 really does. Yeah. And you know, Graham, if I can add to this, as you said, uh, the algorithm targets uh, the inspiratory power, as you said. The other good thing is about it, it takes into account the dead space too. Uh, one of the algorithms, even either whether if you can measure it or it, if you can't, it assumes 2.2 yeah. liter per that space, which is which is good. And what I didn't actually, I kind of skipped through it through the study. The more the stiffer the lung uh, got from like 40 to 30 to 20, the tidal volume actually went down to 5.2 in the severe ARDS with AVM, which I thought is important. Again, I'm not a big believer of certain tidal volume itself, but people, I don't think you're going to erase ever the six milliliter per kg from their brain. That's right. You know, so when they see like something, oh, this is even less, so it might be more clear. So, well, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because what you, you know, in your study, you know, I was going to pick that up, um, was if you have a fixed tidal volume of, say, six mils per kilogram, those magic one numbers, and you're increasing PEEP, right? You're increasing PEEP, and your compliance is low. Well, I mean, heck, this is, you aren't creating lung, lung protective ventilation, are you? And how many people would start hauling back the tidal volume, say, four mils per kilogram to, tr to try and reduce the power, right? And that, I think it's one of the big benefits of, of that, you know, when you're increasing PEEP and then compliance is low, it's, I, I think it's the big benefit. Jeff, you're saying nothing or you're thinking? Oh, no, I've got my hand up. Just been <laughs> I'll put my hand down now. I've got a, I've got a, um, a, uh, a question, really. Um, it relates to a measurement of dead space. Um, the dead space measurement that we measure using volumetric capnography is your physiological dead space. And... Mm -hmm. That is largely due to the VQ abnormalities within the lung. It doesn't actually refer to any anatomical um, changes necessarily. Yeah. So you could, for example, have a patient you're ventilating and then you could suddenly clamp the pulmonary artery. So there's no CO2 going in there at all. And so your calculations of dead space would be all totally out of whack. But mechanical um, forces on the lung would be identical before and after. So I think I, I'm just wondering if there's a flaw in the logic that if you're going to calculate alveolar mechanics using volumetric capnography, your inference is that your alveolar um, capnography is going to inform you about the anatomical uh, dead space or, or about the available lung. Your, the inference is that what is alveolar is the bit that's participating in gas exchange, the bit that's there somehow rather some 
injury occurring to. But I actually don't think that's the case at all. I, I, I think that the anatomical dead space is, as you know, is, is not going to change. The physiological dead space is entirely due to changes in BQ, and it's completely dissociated from the mechanical changes. So uh, that's why I, I therefore I have problems with using volumetric capnography to infer alveolar mechanics by just saying, well, this is anatomical dead space. It's got it's it's X, and therefore we're now only referring to Y degree of alveolar ventilation, and therefore we should um, uh, focus on that as being where the damage has been done. It's equally likely, in fact, perhaps even more likely that you're going to be damaging alveoli that are high, very poorly perfused, which are actually part of the dead space, but you're not actually um, measuring injury too. You could imagine that you could have grossly distended alveoli um, that are uh, injured by the ventilation strategy that have very, very poor perfusion, for example. So I think, I think, we, I think the concept is, is, highly is highly original. However, I am concerned that the, the relationship between what happens anatomically and mechanically um, and what we're seeing with volumetric capnography are two different things. Yeah, I think that raises well a couple of things I want to comment on. I, I think what you're saying too is kind of the reason why many of us don't use uh, volumetric capnography at the bedside because when you need it the most, it seems to have its greatest error. Uh, yes. and, and, and so um, that's one of the old adages, but it also raises the question of, again, the use of trace gas and the potential, and you know, I mean, I, full disclosure, I am, uh, I'm a fan of, uh, of, of uh, applying a trace gas and using that to measure the physiologic dead space or the total dead space, as well as seeing the effective lung volume and the effective perfusion. Uh, because the only thing that's going to take that trace gas total amount away is that which escapes in the earth to ground analogy or the, the pulling of that solubility into the bloodstream. And, um, and, 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 that would give us maybe the right uh, numerators in some of those equations, uh, having a effective alveolar volume that's not necessarily tied to capnography, but is uh, related to uh, measuring, you know, the size of lung. And I guess even EIT could could be a source of of uh, gross volume, or at least a better source of alveolar volume as well. So uh -huh. it seems to me like if we use the ventilator, um, we need to understand that it has limitations in its measurements uh, and we need to understand where those sensors and measuring elements are within the ventilator to generate this data. And that's why something like a capnography device or an external monitoring device that's independent from the ventilator uh, is a good source of, of information about the patient. And again, I say also perhaps EIT is a good source. But at the end of the day, I think we still are looking for specificity in our application. And, um, and we're still far away <laughs> from, yeah. from, from that. Could I just add a, a couple of other things? I, I've always sort of being slightly sceptical of the um, mechanical power because of how it is constructed. And um, Ehab, you have actually talked about this in your presentation. Um, you know, what, you know, the fact that PEEP is not, doesn't contribute to the cyclical changes, it's just there, it's static. And I think PEEP indirectly will influence your um, mechanical power because as you change the PEEP, you change the compliance and you therefore will be um, changing your mechanical power in your equation because you'll be changing your pressures if you're using a, um, a fixed tidal volume, for example. But the other part of the equation is your resistive um, power, resistive um, pressure. And um, there are two parts which, are, which internally conflict with me. One is that if you have a very, very high flow, I can see that you could easily damage 
parts of the lung that have low resistance. So you're instantly transferring a whole lot of energy into those normal bits of lung, which are, do not have a, you know, a crappy mucus plugged airway that's sort of protecting them. Whereas if you did it slowly, you might find um, it's different. And, but equally, if you were to put a resistor in the circuit just for fun and then measure the mechanical power, you get a completely different number. But you know that um, if you put a resistor in the circuit and you turn the, turn the inspiratory pressure up by an equivalent to perfectly overcome that inspiratory resistance, for example, your mechanical power would be different. But you know from first principles that the, the actual mechanics delivered to the lung would be no different. So because you have a variable of resistance in there um, that can be influenced by all sorts of things, and um, it, it, is a, it is an unknown. I, I just wonder whether or not that should actually be left out, in my view. So what you're only dealing with now is the cyclical mechanical um, or elastic pressure changes that um, are the principal components making up your mechanical power. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm just, I'm, I tell you what would, would convince me would be if there was a biological um, mechanical product, and I don't know what it would look like, that could somehow rather record injury over time. Uh, analogy would be somewhat radiographers often wear these sensors that can pick up all the damaging radiation they've been exposed to mm -hmm. over a period of time. And if when they look at their little sensor pad, if it's gone black, they have to be stood down for a number of months or years or whatever the rules are. But if there was a, a mechanical uh, device that you could use that could actually summate the, an injury to a lung um, and you could then subject it, uh, then you could use your mechanical power um, assumptions and then see what the result of it is like in, in some sort of mechanical model. Um, that might be helpful. God knows how you would make that. But because at the moment we're left with biological models which are fraught with problems, and then we're left um, like Greek philosophers sitting around um, wondering, you know, what, what, what the influence of our ventilation is precisely on the lung that we can't see. So, I mean, it's enormously difficult, and I, I just don't know which way to jump, to be honest. And um, maybe, maybe, maybe with mechanical power, we're trying to jump in and bite off too many things at once. And sometimes when you do that, you end up, measuring something which is physiologically not important, but it is influenced by external factors. And then you produce what I would call noise in, the, uh, in your measurement, just measurement noise. What you, the way to avoid that in basic principles is to measure something as simple as you can and to, make, and to remove from that all the possible perturbations that could influence it. So, so you have, when you talked about just measuring uh, the power due to um, elastic pressure changes. Uh, that would be, I think, a, a really good thing to do. Um, that's, yeah, that's all I can say, really. It's, I've just finished reading, I'm just reading this book called Noise by Daniel Kahneman and um, two other professors. Daniel Kahneman is a guy who wrote Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. He got a Nobel Prize for his work. But he talks about measurement errors and he talks about noise and bias. And within our work, I think that by far the largest error of our measurements is noise. And things which affect the measurement error, um, which we know can't uh, implausibly might, would be, it would be implausible that their impact would change what the ventilation is, such as, you know, a, a kink tube increasing your resistive power. Um, that sort of stuff, I think, if we could remove those the element of noise from the equation, then you end up with a, albeit something which might not be a perfect surrogate, something which is stripped of noise and therefore more generalizable and more reliable. Am I making sense? I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it makes sense. And, you know, honestly, like, um, again, I think there's so much unknown, but if you notice now, like there's a lot of research about all the different things. And so I think eventually, we'll get a better idea in the next couple of years. Um, you know, the problem is, it's think about even, we, we can't define even ventilator-induced lung injury per se. 
right? You have mm. a patient the next day, like uh, worsen oxygenation, some x ray, like infiltrates worsens, like, oh, is that pneumonia? Is he aspirated? Is that diffuse alveolar hemorrhage? Is it ventilator induced? So the problem is we can't even define it in real, like, we don't have markers, inflammatory markers in clinical, you know, day to day. Mm. used to say, oh, this was a ventilator induced lung injury because your mechanical power, for, say, for example, is, is this high. We can use it in some animal models and stuff like that. Plus, also, we don't know, sorry, like, that's thing. Um, we don't even know, like, sometimes why people get injured and why people don't get injured, like, despite with some crazy, like, ventilator, like, number, very big, high mechanical power. Somebody, nothing happens to him and they get extubated. And some people be, had bad ARDS. It's, I guess it's like smoking. 20% people get COPD. The other 80, they're fine. So uh, something in our lungs is there's genetic disposition. I don't know. Mm. The, um, I was just thinking about how a, a difference, if you have someone who's at, say, ventilated 10 a peep and then you put the peep to 20, and let's say 20 is not optimal for this patient. It's actually going to cause overstretch. And you subject them to exactly the same tidal pressures. Um, from a sort of an engineering type of perspective, if you have already got over distended lung and you start distending that further, you not in a very nonlinear exponential way will increase the injury to that lung. So mechanical power... Um, it doesn't take that sort of non-linearity of, you know, strain, failure and fatigue and, and damage to the lungs that is brought about by overstretching. It's a bit like getting a, a stick and bending it, bending it, bending it, and just bending it slightly more, boom, it snaps. And um, so there is an element. I mean, when I look at peak, when I first looked at power, when I first read about this a few years ago and I and I saw that I put PEEP in and I thought to myself, well, that's nuts because PEEP doesn't participate in the cycle damage. And then I'm rethinking it. And I think, well, PEEP actually does contribute to injury to lung if it's over distended. And if it's over distended and you cycle patients, you know, through a respiratory uh, um, cycles, then you will be causing more, more injury in a very non-linear way to that lung than you would if you had less PEEP. So I think this is where it all gets really, it gets fudged completely is that I think we are, we are measuring one thing and it's, and it's actually a, a confounder of, of, of something that we do that influences something differently somewhere else. So PEEP, I think, indirectly damages lungs with, in lungs in patients who are not optimised, have got too high level of PEEP. And I think we've seen that in the art, in the art study and we've seen that in, the, um, in one of the oscillation studies, I can't remember which one it was, oscillate, I think it was, where they got, over too much people on board and they actually killed patients. Mm -hmm. So clinical trials have shown that over distension, non-optimization of PEEP is, is injurious. And um, so therefore, if we believe power is injurious and we've got a change in PEEP, then changing PEEP clinically seems to influence the outcome. But it might not be due to power. It's actually due to the fact that the that you've got this non-linear um, yep. uh, effect in tissues which are already distended. So it's, it's, it's even complicated. It's so much more complicated than my brain can handle. And the more I think about it, the more confused I become. Um, but, it does, but I think we've got to keep working on this and just put all those ideas out there and try to chip away at them. And probably my feeling is that we should start with something really, really, really basic. Maybe just, you know, you call it elastic power and use and, and, and focus on that and then add other bits and pieces in. Um, I'll I tell you what I'll do is I'll, I'll again engage my engineering colleagues about all this. I think it almost requires a, a little mini symposium, I, I think, of just discussing from it all, you know, everybody coming in, having a look at this, saying, well, you know, these are the problems I see with mechanical power because it's not measuring this, it's actually measuring something else. Um, and, and coming up with a more strategic way of approaching the problem uh, in a way that minimizes the noise of your error, of your measurement, but whilst in doing so, it might mean that you've got less precision of what you're measuring, at least there's less variability in it. Does that make sense? Yep. No, it, it does. And I would add to that again, 
my earlier point that our data currently comes from within the ventilator uh, and that in some ways we have the fox watching the hen house. I think external data, the external uh, sensors feeding information that then can inform these algorithms is potentially a next step. But as you said earlier, we can't flood the gates with all this extra data or it'll just be noise and, and, and we'll be off in the left and off in the right. And we may have actually found a good step forward, but not mm. realize it. So, yeah, I, I, think I think that's exactly it, Steve. We found a good step forward, but we don't quite realize what we're really measuring. Exactly. Well, we've, we've done that it. before. So yes. we, yeah, we, oh, we, I, we actually, I actually think, though, we actually do have a, there is a, a, a path forward at the moment because you've actually got that in a way with AVM2, right? It's um, because, like you said, Jeff, there's all these confusion with power and so on. What is it? And mm. if you ask most clinicians, okay, this guy's got a high power, whatever, what do you do? So when, you've, when you're using existing old ventilator modes, you fiddle around with tidal volume, adjust peak, adjust rate, adjust everything, mm. right? Where the adaptive concept does it for you because it's it, because the feedback is power, right? It's going to reduce the power automatically. That's yeah. that's to me the step we've actually gone. Can be improved, of course, can be improved a long way, but the, the pathway is already has been set. Yeah, look, I think I, I absolutely one hundred percent agree that we're on the that we're doing the right thing. Um, I'm just trying to. Um, pick apart what exactly what we do have in front of us because we're going to make progress we need to understand exactly what we're what we're doing and how mechanical power exactly influences um, lung injury and that's and that's the tricky bit well like like, like he had said at the very beginning and I, I think it's so appropriate what you know lung injury caused by the ventilator right so mm. is it, so uh, are we better off using for example the AVM2 mode in those lungs that yet don't have lung injury to protect them. Yeah. What is I mean, that to me makes complete sense. Yes. Right? Um, yep. Then, okay, yeah. if I have lung injury, well, okay, it still works. Yeah. Mm. It, I'm not discounting the, the fact that data from within the ventilator isn't important. In fact, I think what algorithms like AVM does is it provides a greater response time in terms of needed change or protection, where in the past right. the human would have to recognize some of these things and act upon them. <laughs> the machine can do it at a much faster rate, can recognize it in a quicker way. But it's still, and, and I don't mean this negatively, but it's still garbage in, garbage out. And when I hmm. peel back the onion on all of these new modes or on new methodology, I always will find at some point, because our brains were hurting thinking of what we were doing with this algorithm, there's that assumption yeah. and that assumption doesn't always apply to all of our patients. So yeah. that's, you know, as you peel back the onion, you'll find, aha, aha they made the assumption that anatomical mm -hmm. dead space should be 2.2 or it should be one per pound or however they want to do it. Uh, and uh, at some point, um, True measurement, true specificity, I think, is the answer. And yeah, a machine making a faster response within a governing set of parameters that the clinicians have agreed to and set. And I think, you know, I'm looking for that. And, and I think we're looking at the potential of seeing that in oxygen control in mechanical ventilation in the near future. Uh, and, um, it, you know. Steve, just on that. Just on oxygen control, there was a, a very interesting paper presented by um, uh, at the ESICM meeting. It was the last session about um, the titrating oxygen to 90 to 94% versus uh, 98 to 100% in first responders to out of hospital cardiac arrests. Oh, well, yeah, I and, saw that article. Yeah, and you know, it seems that targeting too low increases injury, um, and that's presumably due to a whole lot of these saturations that they get. So maybe oxygen control, uh, you know, we've got to have rapid responses that um, flick up O2 when we get desaturations for whatever reason, which mm -hmm. humans are not going to do very well at 
equally, we need to turn it down when it gets too high. And, and I know many of us have been wanting it for the neonatal population and yeah. for the COPD population for obviously different reasons. But uh, yeah. maybe sometimes this stuff doesn't apply to all the patients either. Maybe, maybe some patients are better left alone. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Well, I'm all for the machines. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. And yeah. yep, like you said, Jeff, power the machines. Because what we talk about are machines. <laughs> it's called the rise of the machines. I think I borrowed that from, from Ross. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, All guys. Right. Well, I want to end it in saying breathe easy, but also since we're in Hawaii, I'll say mahalo and alo aloha. And I'll let you guys <laughs> read it and weep. <laughs> All right. Lovely. I'd say, what is it in Cheers. Maori? Matawa. <laughs> right, thank you, guys. Bye. I don't know what you mean, Jeff. I don't know that. <laughs> All right. Cheerio. Bye, Bye, everybody. Good to, good to see you. Thank you. Too sunny. Thanks, Pat. <laughs>